Three Irish men leave prison in Bogota in June last year. Free men after being cleared of training the FARC, left-wing guerrillas in Colombia. In the front seat, Katrina Ruan, Sinn Féin MLA and head of the Bring Them Home campaign. We brought them to a safe place. I stayed with them that night. But their freedom was conditional. They had to stay in the country until an appeal by the prosecution. When the result was announced last December, they were convicted and sentenced to 17 years in prison. But they were nowhere to be found. We left them in safe hands and that's as far as it goes. They were facing 17 years in jail and uh, uh, they went on the run. I mean, this is, this is what uh, Rep Irish Republicans do. The men left prison and since then we've had no communication, no communication with them at all. The Republicans are now wanted men on a terrorist alert in 182 countries. The Colombian vice president wants to know how they got away. The Bring Him Home campaign has a lot of explaining to do to the Irish people, to the international community. The arrests of Niall Connolly, Martin McCauley and Jim Monaghan in 2001 caused serious damage to the peace process. The allegation that the IRA, supposed to be on ceasefire, was sharing its bomb-making secrets with the FARC had the potential to bring down the devolved assembly. The three men were travelling on false passports. They were arrested coming from an area of the jungle which at the time was controlled by the FARC. It was known as the demilitarised zone. The arrests left Sinn Féin in disarray. I have no idea why they were there. I do not have to explain on behalf of Sinn Féin why those people were in Colombia. It's not the business of Sinn Féin why they were in Colombia, so therefore I don't have to give a, an explanation. But I don't have an explanation, which is the essential point that people need to understand. I don't have an explanation. They were not there on behalf of our party, so therefore I don't have to give an explanation. I don't have one. But Sinn Féin did have to explain when more details emerged about the men. Jim Monaghan, seen here at a Sinn Féin conference in the late 80s, was a member until 1990. Security sources described him as head of the IRA's bomb-making department. He had an explosives conviction from the 1970s. Macaulay from Lurgan was said to be his deputy. He had a weapons conviction. Connolly was harder to identify. All that was known about him was that he'd been living in Cuba. The way in which the Columbia Three was handled by Sinn Féin drew people's attention to a pattern of denial on the part of the Republican movement, which I think has been ultimately very, very damaging to them. Confusion over Niall Connolly brought further embarrassment. First, a denial. He's not a member of Sinn Féin. Later, an admission and apology. He had been asked by one of our senior members to represent our party. And I have apologised to everyone, including his family, uh, for any embarrassment which our statement may have caused. Sinn Féin's difficulties increased when a month after the arrests, the 9-11 attacks took place. There is a great deal of hypocrisy and, and double standards around the whole issue of what constitutes terrorism and what doesn't. And Sinn Féin actually was able to use that, that uncertainty and double standards to its advantage for a very long time before 9-11. And what 9-11 did essentially was to turn that advantage into a huge disadvantage. Sinn Féin had always looked to the US for support, but an America that had just declared a war on terror was in no mood to tolerate those consorting with terrorists in Colombia. All of this prompted a congressional committee to hold its own inquiry into the affair. Claims that these individuals were there for benign purposes, specifically ecotourism, or for activities related to the Irish and Colombian peace processes, are an insult to our intelligence. A lot of the ambiguity which had favoured the idea that, while well, the IRA weren't really terrorists, they were really freedom fighters, disappeared in those massive explosions on, on, on September 11th. And really that, that ambiguity from the American point of view at least has, has never really come back into play.
Gerry Adams refused to testify, but earlier comments reflected the intense pressure Republicans were under to distance themselves from terrorism. Terrorism is ethically indefensible. Those responsible for the atrocities in the United States must be brought to justice. And what happened in New York and Washington and Pennsylvania was, as the UN Human Rights Commissioner and former Irish President Mary Robinson said, a crime against humanity. All of this made it difficult for Sinn Féin to publicly campaign for the men's release. Instead, someone outside the party took it on. My view of the Colombian justice system is that there is no justice system here. The, you just Now I look at Human Rights Watch reports, Amnesty International reports, and I agree with every single thing that they say. This is a travesty of justice. Katrina Ruan made it her business to convince the world that the men were innocent victims. If one were ever in a foreign prison, one would want someone as effective as that. She based it on, on two things, really. One was a sort of immediate human sympathy for people caught in this dilemma and, and trying to understand you know, what kind of process they must be going through, what their families must be feeling. Uh, and the, the second aspect of it being around really questioning the propriety of the legal process that these people were going to face. And it just so happens that, uh, that, that the campaign had a very, very good argument on its side. Although not a member of Sinn Féin at the time, Katrina Ruan's role in organising the West Belfast Festival had given her a public profile. The fact she spoke Spanish and had worked in South America made her the perfect candidate. Colombia has been ravaged by decades of conflict between the right-wing government and left-wing guerrillas. Human rights abuses on both sides have left the country with an unenviable reputation. She made use of that poor record to gain international support for the men. Politicians from Ireland, Australia and Canada joined what became known as the Bring Them Home campaign. These were Irish people abroad and uh, there was a case to answer. Uh, so that's how I became involved, basically, at the, at the request of Katrina Ryan. OK, Mary, Central Mary White. When I heard about three Irish citizens in Colombia, I was asked by the families, would I go? And I went as a human rights person to see that the men had safety in prison and that they would get a fair trial. Guildford 4 member Paul Hill was also on side. The safety of these men's world is, is about 320 metres. That's their living conditions. Outside of that, they'd be killed. The publicity helped Katrina Ruan's political career. During the campaign, she joined Sinn Féin and was elected as an MLA. She ran the campaign very, very effectively, but ran it in a way which was pretty, pretty explicit on her part that she had nothing to do with Sinn Féin, this was not a Sinn Féin campaign. Um, she was quite hostile when anybody suggested that she might be connected with Sinn Féin in any way and then suddenly she pops up uh, not just as a Sinn Féin MLA but also as someone who's, who's accompanying Gerry Adams to Downing Street who is clearly quite central to the, the, the Sinn Féin leadership <laughs> and it is difficult to imagine that somebody becomes a central figure in Sinn Féin simply overnight having had no connection with the party previously. In the last four years, Katrina Ruan has made more than 20 trips to Bogota, each time attacking the Colombian system. What has happened is there has been trial by media of these men. I don't believe that they can get a fair trial anywhere in the world now, following all the different allegations and statements and innuendo and smears that have been raised. They've been there for 16 months and it looks like it's going to be another few months before uh, there's an end even to the trial. And I think it's just unacceptable that it's such a long period of time. The security conditions do not exist for three Irish men who have been vilified so much in the press here where such prejudicial comments have been made. Despite Katrina Ruan's fears over a fair trial, the judge found the men not guilty of the more serious charge of training the FARC. They were acquitted pending an appeal by the prosecution. But the courts ruled they had to stay in Colombia while it took place. They were now free to leave jail, provided they pay fines of £4,000 each. The Irish government lent the cash, 
but initially Katrina Ruan refused to pay it, leaving the men in prison. The men were held in the security wing of Bogota's La Modelo jail, where fights often break out and scores of inmates have been murdered. They can't stay here, it's too dangerous. There is no safe place for them. They need to be on the first plane home, and that's my job now, to get them home safely. 5,000 prisoners are crammed into a jail that was built to house half that number. The chronic overcrowding and squalid conditions were often highlighted by Katrina Ruan. But it seemed she was holding out for the Colombian government to overrule the courts and allow the men to go home. She kept making demands on the Colombians uh, because, uh, as far as I could see, she wasn't happy with, uh, with what they were coming up with. There seemed to be a lot of wrangling going on and uh, agendas of different kinds were being pursued on all sides. The Colombian government said it was the non-governmental organizations that had the agenda. For the first time since the men disappeared, the Colombian vice president agreed to talk about the case. Well, actually, these three fugitives of the law started playing a game right after the first uh, decision by the court. Uh, they said that they were in danger. We gave them all the guarantees of protection. They said that they didn't want it guarantees by uh, the Colombian government. There was pressure from NGOs, and we said, okay. And an NGO said, we'll take care of them, we'll hide them, and said, okay, you do what you have to do. That's the moment when I knew, or I, 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 I thought, that, uh, that uh, they were not playing a fair game, which now we know. They weren't allowed to return home, so Katrina Ruan turned her attention to what would happen while the men stayed in the country. A government human rights official told us she asked for clothing, housing and health care. He said she also asked for protection. She asked all the time for guarantees for their security if they remained here. Now I understand her main objective was to take them to Ireland and that the Colombian state would be seen as wrong, whatever the result. We went to see Katrina Ruan. She asked to be interviewed as chairperson of the Bring Them Home campaign, not as an MLA. But a Sinn Féin press officer was present and imposed a time limit of 15 minutes on the interview. We asked her about the allegations the Colombian government had made. Well, I never said to the Colombian authorities that we wanted security from them. Never. Because I don't trust Colombian security. But that's not what she said last year. Well, the purpose of this meeting is to uh, discuss what security arrangements um, that they're going to put in place. Um, as uh, everybody knows here, this is a very, very dangerous country. It's dangerous inside and outside. And we're going in to see, put a bit of meat on the bones and see what, uh, what exactly they have in mind. Is there any chance of the men getting out of prison today? It's up. The ball is in the Colombians' court. The men can be out of prison now if the Colombians come up with what they should. We came to the conviction that they had a political interest and not an interest in the truth. What the woman wanted was a political success in returning them to Ireland and to morally sanction the Colombian state. With heads she won, with tails I lost. That was the position of Miss Katrina. Uh, but she had total access and total help from the government. Um, she cannot say that the government did not, uh, uh, did, did not do everything she asked the government for. In the end, the Bring Them Home campaign provided their own security, and the men left with Katrina Ruan, the last person to be seen with them. The media outside the prison witnessed what happened. It was around five in the afternoon. We were here since midday because there was talk they'd be released soon. That day, Katrina entered. She was in there for a while. All of a sudden, when we were in front of the gate, we realized there were two trucks coming, and we realized that Katrina was coming. We guessed that the Irishman came on the back seat, hidden, because we could never really see them. So we know this is the road they took from the prison. A cameraman followed them, but was forced back. It's clear that Katrina Ruan and the three Irishmen didn't want anyone to know where they were going. 
So they could have taken this road north, the 10-hour journey to the Venezuelan border, or they could have turned back and headed south for Ecuador. The answer to that question lies with them. We brought them to a safe place, and we had, I stayed with them that night. We had a discussion with them for their safety. Uh, we said, and they were uh, very clear on this themselves, because they know Colombia, they, they know the dangers for them in, in the jail and outside the jail. Um, they, have, they could have no contact with their families, they could have no contact with me, because their families and myself would be like uh, red lights. Um, and that's the last time that I saw those men. Did the Bring Them Home campaign give them money? I'm not prepared to enter into any other discussion for their safety on what the Bring Them Home campaign did or didn't do. Under the cover of the Bring Them Home campaign, did you do a disappearing act? I think uh, the Bring Them Home campaign has a lot of explaining to do to the Irish people, to the international community. Is it correct to assume that your intelligence services are working on this with um, intelligence services in other countries to try and track them down? I'd rather not comment on that. Um, I mean, we're obviously very much trying to find out what has happened to them. Is there anyone else you think we should talk to or that we could talk to that could maybe help us? I think you should talk to Ms. Catriona. I don't know where they are. If the men did leave Colombia as soon as they left the jail, they had a six-month head start on the police forces who are now tracking them down. Eight million people live in Bogota, more than in the whole of Ireland. They could easily hide here, never mind somewhere else in South America. Back in Ireland, the men's families say they too are in the dark. Since the arrests, relatives have been advised not to speak to the media about the case. But at a fundraiser in Bundoran last month, Niall Connolly's family agreed to talk to Spotlight. There is nothing to say that they're out of Colombia. That's running, you know, Asario, the Attorney General, said they left Colombia. Uh, there's absolutely no evidence of that. We have had no communication with them. We don't know where they are. There's nothing to say um, that they have. We're only hoping that they're heading in the right direction. The family say they were surprised when Niall was arrested, especially his 80-year-old mother. He's a carpenter by trade, building houses for the underprivileged and, uh, you know, I just didn't know what he was doing and I suppose presumably he would be worried he wouldn't tell me what he was doing if he thought it was, uh, but he, as far as I knew he was just working in the third world for the poor of the third world, which he's always worked for the poor in any world because that's Niall. During the fundraiser, Dan Connolly told the crowd the money raised would pay for the fight to clear the men's names. He was there supporting Colombia people. He made a very, very clear statement in, in, in the court as to exactly what he was doing in Colombia. They're political activists. They're well able to look after themselves. They're not afraid of anything. They're Republicans and, and you know, they, they'll, they'll stand proud beside any other Republicans and they look after themselves. may well be able to look after themselves, but if they're going to try to return to Ireland, it will be difficult to do so legitimately. They're now wanted by the police in 182 countries. As long as that person is on red notice, that indicates the person is dangerous and is wanted by the state, where he has an arrest warrant out for the person, and that country immediately informs Colombia that the person is there and therefore Colombia can initiate procedures through diplomatic channels to formally request the extradition of that person. Interpol say they're confident they'll find them, but one security specialist we spoke to is not so sure. These individuals are going to have a history of getting lost, so that is not a surprise to me that they would be able to move and, and surreptitiously get from one location to another. Some security sources believe the men are hiding in Cuba, so we travel to the capital, Havana. 
Niall Connolly was Sinn Féin's representative here, underlining the close links between Irish Republicans and the Cuban government. Connolly left Dublin for Latin America 15 years ago. He moved to Cuba from Nicaragua with his wife and their children. I've been interested in Latin America and the politics of the region since the 1980s. There's a memorial to the hunger strikers in Havana. It was here that Jerry Adams met Fidel Castro four years ago. He also laid a wreath at the monument. There are tight restrictions on journalists working in Cuba and there are obvious sensitivities surrounding this case. But we managed to track down an address for Connolly in Havana. It was about 40 minutes by road into the city's suburbs. Although the house looked deserted, someone answered when we rang the bell. It's been a year and a half and living here, but before I didn't. This is an Irish man's house. What did she say about the man from Irlanda? Mm -hmm. Niall Connolly? I know he's not in Cuba anymore. We find a second address, this time in the name of Connolly's wife. We decided to check it out, and it turned out to be the family home. Hola, hola, Liz. When we asked to speak to his wife, the woman inside closed the door and didn't want to speak to us. We approached some of the neighbours and they told us they hadn't seen Niall Connolly recently. She is a very good doctor and a very nice person. And her husband, was he working? No, I wouldn't be able to tell you if he was working. I really don't know. I used to see him, but it's been years since I haven't seen him. The BBC is one of the few foreign media organisations allowed to have a base in Cuba. Our correspondent isn't convinced they're here. I think the key thing, though, is that if they are here, Cuba would know about it. This is a country where the Cuban government knows what's going on. It knows who's coming in and out of the country. There's a very good effectively like a sophisticated neighbourhood watch scheme going on in every single little town and village in Cuba. So if they are here, Cuba is authorising that, and that's quite a risk for the Cuban government to take. What does the future hold for the Columbia Three? Are they going to hide until the dust settles, or will they risk returning to Ireland? There's no extradition treaty between Ireland and Colombia, but the Colombian vice president would expect the Irish government to send them back to his country. As a government that, has, that knows what that means and that knows uh, uh, what uh, explosives are in a, in a, in, 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 in a community of, 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 of citizens, would uh, act in compliance with the law and would act um, uh, politically correctly, which is uh, having those persons uh, um, go to jail in Colombia. So you would expect the government to send them back to Colombia? There's, there are some, obviously, as you said, there are some problems, which is that we don't have extradition, extradition but uh, where there's a will, there's a way. But that's not how Niall Connolly's brother sees it. We will expect of the Irish government, not only if they come back to Ireland, but if they were to turn up in any other jurisdiction, we would expect that the Irish government would be looking for them to be brought back here and to deal with it from here, not to hide away from it. So what would the Irish government do if the men showed up in Ireland? Foreign Affairs Minister Dermot O'Hearn wouldn't give us an interview, even though we asked five times in the space of four weeks. In a statement, his spokesman said, it would be inappropriate to speculate on what may happen if the men return to Ireland. We put the same question to Fianna Fáil Senator Mary White. Do you think the Irish government would send them back to Colombia? I do. This problem, of course, which is already excruciating, has become vastly more tortuous for the Irish government when the men went on the lam, because a government scam can't be seen to stand over people who are, who are running away from whatever judicial process is there. On the other side, if these men turn up in Ireland again, 
um, and are walking around the streets and, and, and the Colombian government is demanding that they be extradited back to, to serve their sentences. How does a democratic government deal with, with that kind of, of, of dilemma? It's a very, very difficult political issue for them. But this has been an equally difficult political issue for the Colombian authorities. Certainly the Colombians didn't make any real effort to keep tabs on these guys. You know, I mean, it is, I mean, they run the country in name. It's their country. I mean, can you imagine the three guys getting out of Mount Joy Jail here and just disappearing? I mean, there'd be so many special branch men following them, like, you know. <laughs> Every time they scratch their head, there'd be a, there'd be a special branch man, you know, right, right behind them taking notes. However easily the men were able to abscond, they are now in breach of Colombian law. Back in December, the Taoiseach said the men should accept the court's decision. What I would do is I'd accept the legal process. You know, I, I, I might, you might feel personally somewhere about it, but I accept the legal process. So where does that leave Katrina Ruan, an elected representative? As a human rights activist, I am going to stand up for justice and human rights. But you're still an elected representative who is condoning people breaking the law. No, I am not. What I'm saying is the Colombian government have broken the law. The Colombian government have broken the law. Three the Irish men broken the law no. for not for leaving the country. That was a condition. I mean, well, you campaigned hard to try to get the Colombian authorities to overturn that decision. Well, first of, the court, of all, I, I don't succeed. know where the men are. So you're making a presumption there. I don't know where they are. No, but by continuing to campaign on their behalf, it's a. I mean, I'm asking you, do you condone what they've done? What I'm saying to you is, this is a miscarriage of justice of mammoth proportions, and I am going to continue to campaign for those men. But with respect, an answer to that question, do you condone them going on the That's run? That's a personal decision for those men. It seems to me that Sinn Féin has been very lucky that the Colombian justice system is pretty dodgy. It, it's been a suitably ambiguous process, I think, from, from Sinn, Sinn Féin's point of view, where they can quite reasonably point to the fact that look, this isn't a legal process that, that, that meets norms of international law. Now, never mind the fact that Sinn Féin itself doesn't meet any of the, the, the norms of international law, that the IRA has consistently broken all of the norms of international law in terms of the conduct of, of conflicts for a period of 30 years. The last legal route for the men is an appeal to the highest court in Colombia, a process that can take place despite their absence. Niall Connolly's mother is confident her son will be home soon. I can only hope that when they do come home, certainly I'm going to march down a common street. Whether he'll come with me or not, I don't know. But all I can do is try. They're fugitives. Uh, you cannot, uh, you cannot, if you're a, a, a rule, abiding citizen, you accept a judicial process.